Hello, this is Dr. Siduri Christensen from UTSA, the University of Texas at San Antonio, and you're watching the Teaching Learning Cast with Piri Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. Okay, welcome. Hello, uh, this is Teacher Learning Cast, episode number 10. Today is May 12th, 2018. My name is Benjamin Stewart, calling in from beautiful Aguas Calientes, Mexico. Good morning, everybody. This is Piri Herrera, again with you this Saturday. Nice morning, nice weather, and expecting a little bit of heat today here in Aguas Calientes. And uh, we're back on the air to talk about education and learning a little bit. Um, <clears throat> My name is Piri Herrera, and uh, we have this space to discuss about education and learning, and we hope you're getting used to watching us. Welcome, everybody, in Facebook Live also. We have a secondary transmission, but you can get to the original link if you click above and you go to the YouTube transmission or the Facebook fan page, which is Teacher Learning Cast. If you want to reach out to us individually, each of us have a website. Uh, PD can be reached at homers2000.wixsite.com forward slash PDHA. That's P I R Y H A. I can be reached at benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com. Again, we thank you for watching. Uh, we really encourage anyone who wants to be a part of the conversation to reach out to us on Facebook, leave your comments, uh, leave us feedback about the uh, show. If you ever want to become part of the broadcast, feel free to contact us as well. We uh, are always looking for uh, educators to join us in the live broadcast. We meet every week, every Saturday morning uh, on uh, Google Hangouts. So again, feel free to let us know if you want to be a part of the conversation. Again, uh, welcome. Yeah, last, last week we had a couple of discussions about, uh, first of all, performance tasks in the classroom and we also talk about how to connect with the students in the classroom in at, uh, at the level of knowing them and, ha and, and having these successful ideas for classroom activities and also this performance task has to be efficient. And today we have something very interesting that Ben wants to share with us, Ben. Yeah, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, immersive task. I was, uh, browsing the internet and came across this interesting article and wanted to share a few points uh, about about this article and uh, throw in a couple of uh, thoughts of my own uh, to kind of complement some of the ideas here. But uh, the idea here of immersive task really uh, relates a lot to what we talked about last week, PD, about uh, uh, performance tasks. And, um, you know, as we've been doing this now for, this is our 10th episode, I think, uh, we would both agree that we're seeing a lot of concepts and ideas that are repeated, but from different perspectives. So I think this is a good example today where we look at this idea of immersive tasks and find some similarities and differences about uh, what it means to create and implement immersive tasks versus maybe a performance test that we addressed again last week. So one of the uh, key ideas here in this article uh, they they begin by defining immersive tasks by identifying it as a magical moment where students interact with one another in such a way that epitomizes language learning. So they talk about this idea of flow of how things are just kind of uh, on their own, kind of moving along, and, and students are engaged in the the performance test. Um, but they they state that the in this particular article, I'll scroll down a little bit here, but the, the idea here is that uh, they are saying that it's difficult to find evidence that does not identify speaking as either the most important or challenging skill to master. So their, their whole premise in this article is that, teach, or that teaching speaking in an English language learning class is really the most challenging part. And uh, this was something that I think that I would agree in part, but I, I think that we could also look at some of the concepts that we're gonna talk about today with regard to this article 
in terms of maybe other language skills being a challenge as well. And, and it really boils down to whether or not you want to look at isolating certain skills like speaking or maybe integrating other skills. I remember when I was learning uh, Spanish, I, I moved to, to Mexico from, from the United States and I was learning and it was very difficult for me to understand others who were speaking to me. I had had some courses in Spanish and could speak a little bit, but to understand someone was really the hardest part. So whether you're looking and working with learners and, and you identify speaking as the, the most important skill or listening, um, I think it is important to, to try to identify those speaking skills, the listening skills, or any other uh, linguistic skills that they are having the most problems with and consider those uh, within the context of some of the points that, that I wanna address here uh, in a few moments. So in this article, they talk about when we say immersive, they say what we mean, uh, we mean tasks to which we give all of our attention, tasks that are goal-driven and tasks that are based on goals that are engaging enough for us to focus them entirely. So they talk about this again, this idea of tasks that put us in a state of flow that really, um, where students are automatically engaged in the activity and they're kind of moving along. Um, I know, Pity, you're a, you're a musician. I think you can relate to this idea of flow as well when you're locked in so well with other members of a, of a group that things are just kind of moving along and, and things are really just as tight as possible. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a better you know, ex experience when, you're, when you have this type of performance. But I think as teachers and educators, it, it kind of translates to this context as well, where, where maybe we're not uh, always the, the, the speaker, the sage on the stage, so to speak, and students are engaged in ta taking part in the conversation and in the, the task itself. But one of the things, uh, the, one of the first things that they mentioned here about how to kind of achieve and think about these types of tasks or how to reach this immersive experience is to choose topics which students are interested in. And I think this relates a lot to uh, what we talked about last week, but trying to find the relevance of a task, you know, not just that it's meaningful, but it's actually relevant to their needs. And, and you spoke last week, Petey, about uh, the importance of maybe at the beginning of a court class, how to reach out to those students, maybe spending five minutes or so trying mm -hmm. to connect with the other students and trying to find out what their interests are. And we talked last week about that could also extend really throughout the whole semester as we're constantly learning more about the students uh, and how we, you know, begin with, uh, you know, how we really just try to find and learn more about the students as we go through uh, the semester. I don't know, Pity, in your case, uh, I know you work a lot with uh, teacher trainers and have you seen some of these, uh, some examples of where students have tried to uh, reach out and find what the interests are to, for them to make a, a determination of what topics that they should implement in, in their classroom? It, it's kind of difficult in certain stages of the semester because the students are just, uh, well, the ones that I have right now are assistants. So they just teach once 15 minutes in a week. And the rest of the time they do observations and they support the, 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 the main teacher of the class. And, and at the beginning of the semester it's kind of difficult because they don't know students. And, uh, and whatever they plan and whatever they prepare is based on whatever the teacher can, uh, the, the actual teacher, the main teacher of the course can tell them. And, and that's why since the very beginning, uh, we had uh, a couple of uh, analysis of uh, precisely the goals of the class and the stating of the language topic, the function of the language for the day, and the specific example we needed uh, as, a, as a sample to know what we expect the students to produce and, um, and the context itself. And we did a couple of exercises about that in order to 
the assistant, when he is assigned a topic, he he's uh, entitled to ask a little bit more about that topic to the main teacher of the course. Because sometimes uh, the main teacher just tells them, prepare something about uh, this grammar tense or prepare this vocabulary. And um, and sometimes they they don't really know what is the context about it, or or maybe they have the book and they can help themselves. But but most of the time they have to ask more and more questions in that moment to the main teacher. That is who knows a little bit more the students or has a little bit more experience about the course itself, about the book itself, and can give all this information around to complement as to fit the task and the activities better to the students. As the time goes a uh, little by little, these assistants start to know students and start to know a little bit more the dynamic of the course and the teacher specifically they are supporting. And little by little, they uh, with less and less information, they can compose their class and fit it to students, which uh, to begin with, they do it in general uh, adaptation performances like um, like what I mean by this is like they uh, they they set up situations which we believe in conjunction the assistant the teacher and myself as a tutor may fit the age of the students that are with them and that's pretty much the beginning of it right but but it's our perception and I think the best thing in here would be to actually have a constant dialogue uh, in with the students themselves. Yeah, because I wondered if your students are assisting teachers, I guess I see two ways that they could maybe find out how how a teacher might uh, find what's interesting for the students and what, what are, what's not. They could either observe it and if they're observing, right, if they're looking and watching and observing the teacher in class, uh, they could see examples of how the teacher is uh, getting this information um, or they could just ask them, right? Of course, right. So they ask them, "How did you find out?" It's kind of a kind of a, a meg metacognitive type of question. How did you find out? You know, or how do you find out in general what the interests are of, of the students? So those teachers, uh, teacher, student teachers are, you know, getting that information because it may or may not be that obvious to them as well. I don't know, um, but I wonder too in more advanced practicum classes in their planning and implementing how they how they consider the the, the interests of the of the students right because okay. I, I would assume they have more time than with each of the groups so they could uh, i guess plan on in, in their planning they could figure in how they they connect what what have you seen uh, maybe you haven't seen it this semester because you don't have those courses I'm, I'm what have you seen in the past i'm kind of not really answering about the events of students and that's why because this semester I don't have them the ones that are in practicum but I can tell you what happens in teaching workshop which is uh, we, which is before the assistance but but I think it's a good example of uh, looking for activities that suit the students these guys in in teaching workshop teach amongst themselves so they simulate classes at the beginning of the class they give a profile a, a simulated profile uh, of students, which sometimes is something as simple as you guys are yourselves or you guys are kids from uh, of uh, around 10 years old or things like those. And sometimes they're very elaborated profiles. So since since considering an actual profile, uh, I think that that gives a way that students are actually thinking about something that suits the students they pretend to teach. But, but the most uh, important example in here is that whatever they decide to do or whatever profile they fit, they know their classmates because they've been together for at least a year. So whatever they do, they select things that they for sure know will fit to their classmates and, and will catch their attention and will get them involved. Since the context that they select for it, since, for example, we have classes in which they use music or song, they select proper songs that they actually know their classmates like. Uh, they, it's, it's kind of, uh, sometimes I've seen some, some of these uh, teachers that they select something that they actually only like themselves and they know for sure that the rest of their classmates, they don't like it that much or they're not familiar with. 
but they do that with the intention of uh, presenting part of themselves to their classmates. And I think that would be the hidden intention. That, that would be my guess, right? Not, not, not for sure, right? But, yeah. but, in, but in general, every single class in teaching worship, uh, I see whether they set a profile and they ask their classmate to pretend or not, all of these aspects, like the context themselves, the kind of examples they bring, the, in, in, indeed the material they bring, it's something that they actually infer it's going to work with their actual classmates. And that's because they know them. They, they've been together for a year. So I, have you seen cases where your student teachers have expressed to you uh, very explicitly that they have planned and implemented a particular activity based on the interests of the students when through your observations you've witnessed maybe the 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 opposite or maybe you felt that the students weren't engaged they they weren't into the activity but your student teacher thought the opposite and uh, what have you seen that and what do you do in those cases oh uh... I, I kind of recall a couple of times of the ones I told you when they intend to present something that they actually personally like as to share part of themselves with their classmates. And, uh, and sometimes it does not really fit well. For example, I, 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 I'm, I'm having the student in mind and I try to remember the topic because it was something about weapons something like that and it was totally something uh, something he is into and, and and he brought vocabulary about certain uh, i don't i can i don't remember if it was a gotcha gun or something like that and he was uh, he used the vocabulary with his classmates but actually it was something that it wasn't catchy for the rest of the students and he was so excited about that and that was indeed part of the reflection we had. And, and, and if, if I have a time, I can look into it because I have the written feedback for him about that. He ended up enjoying his class and having, getting so immersed into teaching that it was, and the way I put it to him, it was like, it's your own party. It's you in there talking about your favorite thing and showing us everything you know about it. You remember we talked about this, Ben, then, when the, student, the teacher wants to show that I know, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, me as a teacher, I want to show that I know. So yeah, he was trying to present all of his information. He intended to teach vocabulary about guns, but at the end, students were not really into it. Where we were just just looking at his performance, like I, I was sensing at it as a play. He is actually there having a performance about something that, um, yeah, may be interesting for moments or not, but at the end, the students were not engaged. And that totally opened the door to having a teacher-centered class. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, that, that's a good point. I think one of the takeaways from this article is looking at uh, student interests that lead to this, this engagement, right? This immersion of, being able to obtain flow, the state of flow where things are moving along. And, and, but yeah, I think this, this whole interest, this idea of trying to find topics that are based on the student's interest is important and interesting in how we look at ourselves and our own practice and making sure that our own, our own biases don't end up taking over uh, the whole educative experience. Uh, let me move on to the next idea that they talk about. And this idea, they mention it as embedded uh, tasks that are embedded into the topic. So tasks, they're embedded into the topic. So um, for me, this, I would paraphrase this or I would word this as learning sequence, right? And we talked a lot about this last week is looking at each of the activities, maybe looking at beginning with activities that are more simple, that lead more to more complex uh, activities maybe that introduce critical thinking over time so that over time the tasks require a little bit more, more thinking. And, and we talked last week about performance tasks really being the ultimate task, the ultimate activity that maybe a, the, a group of learners are working towards. 
So for me, tasks that are embedded within the topics, uh, maybe this is uh, looking at one or two topics over the course of a week or two that different types of activities, whether they're uh, debates or maybe just handouts or just small speaking activities in pairs, whatever they happen to be, but maybe they're all related to these uh, similar related topics uh, over time. So uh, they talk about that being very important. They also talk about the importance of purpose. And we, we spoke about this as well, but they say that they word it as how, how can we have students uh, or how can they be exploited to make more quality time for speaking? And again, they're talking mainly on, about speaking, but how can we exploit a, a, the time? And for me to exploit the time, that is, how can we provide the most value in the classroom over time so that we're not wasting time? And we've talked in other broadcasts about flipped learning. So for me, flipped learning really deals a lot about how we can get the most out of the classroom face-to-face -face experience. And, you know, face to, uh, flipped learning can mean a lot of different things. Uh, it's not always just preloading the content where students are watching maybe a video before the class. Um, because quite honestly, uh, that version of flipped learning is a, quite a challenge, in, in, at least in my context here in Mexico, that, um, you know, a lot of students aren't really used to accessing the content really beforehand. Um, I, I have found some success, I think, in flipped learning where videos are used outside of class to complement what we do in class. But just is gonna depend, I think, on your own teaching approach and how uh, the, the profile of the teachers and students uh, in a particular institution, for example. Um, but thinking about teacher training, when we look at, the organization of time. We talked a little bit about this again last week as well, but um, you know, what are some challenges? And it, those of you who are watching this video, watching this broadcast, thinking about your own practice, how do you go about organizing your ideas, your activities over time with your students so that they aren't just isolated uh, cases of activities, but that they lead and take the most advantage of the time in class? In your case, PD, have you? How do you deal with students that you see moments where in class, let's say that it's uh, not value added, right? So there's some times where there's, you know, maybe they're off task or things are just not moving along. That there's not a flow. Um, you know, how how do we reflect? How do student teachers reflect on those experiences to turn those uh, into a learning experience? Well, it, it, every time we, we analyze the class, uh, it's a challenge to, um, to make the students aware that it's not about uh, pointing out failures, but that we cannot even leave them aside. And, and, and that we need to find a way to, to um, enrich the situations in which the class is not having that flow or the activities are totally detached. Or at the end we had like uh, in a 15 minute class, we had three activities, which at the end were not, con were not connected or things like those or, 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 or whatever happens when, when there's something to improve. It's always, uh, the first thing is to make it clear so that the teacher himself is aware of what actually happened. Because sometimes they believe uh, uh, everything went okay. And sometimes they don't have anything to say about that. And sometimes the other teachers that are there uh, acting as students, they, they also sometimes, they just have the feeling that something was not uh, that fluent or that was not okay, but they don't actually know what. And, and sometimes we say, well, the class, it's okay. It's a regular class and, and we had a practice, and, but, but they don't have that sense. So the first thing, and I think that's important, to start exploring um, uh, together with the teacher himself, the observer that we have, because we have an observer at the same time, the, the, another, another student observing, and the students participant acting as students, as language students, um, 
to set and start, uh, we ask for, for whatever comment we have. And if there's a situation, uh, we ask for opinions, for clarifications. Sometimes I have to intervene a little bit more and actually tell them uh, about something that they are not considering. And, and then from there, start to get ideas. What, uh, what, uh, what can this, uh, how can this be enhanced or what can be changed? And sometimes the difficult part in, in simulated classes is that uh, all of them know the language. So there are many situations in which they don't consider uh, things that they may face in a real group. And nobody realizes about that from, from the participants because they actually know the language. So sometimes I have to, to pinpoint like this aspect that you that happened in the classroom work well and everybody could work and if this happens in this way because you did this and, and students already know the language. Uh, for example, and, and I think this, this may clarify the question you have about, about this uh, connection of activities. We just had a class during the week in which uh, the practice was uh, parts of the body vocabulary, something simple. And, but at the end, I wanted them to fit the vocabulary with key language, with at least a pattern to follow, just uh, for the sake of not having just uh, a coral repetition or a spelling drill in which they just presented the drill and that's it. But uh, after the drill or whatever they decided to do for presenting the vocabulary, they could use it at least in a phrase as a sample, as an example, as a little bit more pur purposeful use of the vocabulary during those 15 minutes as a presentation. But then what happened in this class is that in the key language, the vocabulary about parts of the body was used with adjectives which were not taught at that moment or, or were not considered to be known by students. And the, the different use of the verb to be is are, according to the part of the body and adding the adjective. So uh, my sense is it worked very well with these students because they know the language. But my, my comment in there is that you have to be very careful because you are uh, presenting to students the parts of the body and then you are asking them to use as many adjectives as parts of the body you are teaching and the adjectives you are not even reviewing them for students. So in a real class, this could have been a big, big problem in a big situation because at the end, the adjectives were not there. They were not outside. They were never reviewed and the students had to bring them from their own mind. And, 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 I, and I told them, yes, we can consider that, that they know certain things, but considering that your topic is parts of the body, basic level vocabulary, I would consider that they may not be able to recall that, those, uh, that much amount of adjectives and to be able to, by themselves, without any guide, without any format, without any, any, any help from the, the teacher, nor visual, nor additive, nor reviewing, to construct in a complex sentence, well, semi-complex sentence, sentence the adjective and the, and the use of the part of the body. And that's something that was not a problem in that simulated class because the students actually know all of the language, but it's something that you have to pinpoint and tell them, you have to be very careful about this. Why didn't you, and, and then I started to ask, why didn't you review the adjectives before using them? Why didn't you elicit from the students the use of the difference E's and R just to make sure, just for the sake of making sure that they actually knew it? And, and pretty much the answer was because it wasn't needed. For sure, they would know it <laughs> because they are teachers, obviously. But in a real group, this would be a, a situation. And, and, and maybe that goes towards the answer of your questions. You need to ask a lot and, and, and set situations on the table and put it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm so they can understand a little bit and start to get their own ideas on how to improve. Because the final question in here is, so for everybody, for all participants, let's, uh, let's just complement this idea. If we have all of these three topics together in one sentence, what can be done? And they start to say, well, I would bring a wall chart with the list of adjectives, 
I would take uh, during the presentation of the parts of the body, at the same time having the review of the adjectives in the color repetitions, and things like those come up, and the teachers take it into consideration. And most of the time, when these kind of things happen for the following class, I see they try to implement these ideas. Yeah, I think it's about really just trying to anticipate uh, problems, trying to anticipate what uh, issues are going or could happen in, in the class. I'm wondering too, in those, those students who are observing other teachers in action, those could also be questions that they pose to, to those in-service teachers. Like, I, I observed your class today. Uh, those activities, you know, what were already planned out that you anticipated? What were things you did today that you didn't anticipate and you had to modify? Because maybe that was obvious, maybe it wasn't obvious uh, to the observers or the student who's observing the class, uh, what was planned, what was not. So right. I, I see a lot of opportunities in those cases where let's say maybe they're not ready for teaching, but they're observing that they're already having these conversations and thinking about anticipated and unanticipated types of uh, teaching and learning situations that are, that are coming up. So then when they start um, you know, teaching on their own, that they're aware of this. And I, I almost see, and correct me if I'm wrong, so typically like student teachers will first observe, then they might uh, go into courses where they're teaching with their classmates, right? kind of like a role play, and then they go into teaching other classes. So I kind of see opportunities of having these unanticipated problems or issues, these types of conversations more in the uh, observation classes and then obviously when they're teaching their own classes but yeah like you said when they're working with their classmates it's almost like they have to yeah pretend and actually come up with uh, you know maybe even the classmates who are students quote-unquote students in the class uh, maybe part of that is them coming up with questions and things that uh, might pop up that maybe the the teacher student teacher isn't prepared for so that they, they get used to that practice of kind of imp improvising and, and you know on the fly when things aren't going well uh, so that they get used to that before they go into a real classroom. But I think we all face this, whether we're conscious of it or not, that you know basically everything we do is either anticipated or unanticipated, something that kind of comes up that we weren't really planning. And, and it happens in every classroom, right? It, things come up that we think is you know going to go well and it doesn't. So um, I, I think that's interesting, and I think that's a, a part of really, uh, regardless if you're an experienced teacher or not, that this is uh, something that we face. Trying to exploit this time, trying to get the most value out of every moment, right, so that that uh, students are learning as much as possible on any given day. Yeah, and 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 you know one of the things in this immersive test when when you actually nail the topic for students is that um, you have to be very careful also that the task itself uh, it's actually helping the development of the language or the practice of the different skills because then you can you can uh, easily lose track and have fun with the students and they enjoy the activity and you do it and do it again because you know they are participating and enjoying the class but at the end the amount of uh, the exposure to the language is minimum and that's something I, I, I talked a lot to them I just had another class in which the teacher came before they came they come before with their lesson plan and, and the idea of the teacher was to uh, take students outside the classroom to jump the rope, to practice a certain feature of the language. That was the idea. And, 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 I, and we had a long talk, about half an hour, just to make her aware, like, it's very important that you understand how much time you're going to take to set the activity, to take all the students outside the classroom, to give the, uh, and, and then you are in a different setting in which, um, uh, you have to control the students outdoors and your voice, your performance has to be totally different from the one inside the classroom and then set the activity and have them practice. Now, my question was, all of this is worth it in comparison to the exposure to the language they're going to have? 
Are they actually going to be practicing that much as to be worth it to spend the time in setting all of this and to take the risk of controlling all students outside the classroom? And it was something that at the beginning, the teacher um, was like kind of, she, she looked kind of disappointed, like, well, I'm not going to do it then. And, and then we kept on with the talk just to make her aware that it's not about changing the activity. It's not about deciding like, no, well, then I'm not going to do it. And it's like, you have to make the decision, but you have to consider the amount of exposure and practice they're going to have. And, and we spent a long time on that, like half an hour in the discussion. And at the end, I thought she wouldn't do it because of the way the conversation ended. But the day of the class came and she actually took, took them out. And one of her major concerns was that at all moments, they would be practicing the language so that it was worth it. And at the end, she was pretty uh, satisfied with, the, with the, her decision and what she did. And it's something that worked well, obviously, with some aspects to improve and some other discussions we have about it. But in the core aspect that, that, that we had discussed before, she totally took attention on that. And it, it, and it was worth it. So, this immersive task, we just have to be careful that it's worth it uh, for the kind of task, complexity, uh, uh, intellectual investment, uh, teacher guidance, uh, or whatever is needed, aside the linguistic demand, that it's worth it in comparison to the exposure and practice of the language. You're, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, the I, I think of the three E's uh, being not just engaging, but also effective and efficient. So if you look yeah. at any activities, trying to think of the three E's, is it engaging, is it effective, and is it efficient? Effective in terms of both linguistic uh, effectiveness, so are we meeting certain linguistic goals, but also the overall goals or the realistic or authentic goals of the task itself. So if we're looking at tests that are authentic, they're gonna probably address some quote unquote real world uh, goal or objective. So as language educators, it's just trying to, our job is to try to create that environment where we are not only promoting realistic goals, authentic goals, but also ling linguistic goals, right? So right. yeah, definitely uh, it's important to think of both of it being engaging, effective, and efficient. Um, moving on to some other good points here about immersive tasks and how to implement these immersive tasks is also the importance of how to promote critical thinking. And uh, they don't talk about it much in this article, but for me, critical thinking, uh, there's a lot of different ways to look at this, but one, uh, I think, relates a lot to learning strategies. So how can we promote learning strategies that promote critical thinking. So if we're looking at, for example, the Venn diagram to compare and contrast, uh, we're looking at mind maps to conceptualize abstractly certain ideas that uh, we want our learners to, to later produce, whether it's speaking or writing. Um, but it's really how to, uh, you know, maybe even promote questioning, like through the Socratic method. Uh, how do we, form good questions to for students to to think it might even be a metacognitive learning how do we promote metacognitive thinking and, and uh, different types of activities that promote uh, how we learn how the learners themselves learn and ask that question right um, I think that uh, critical thinking is also very key regardless of the level of, of language. I think we can even promote critical thinking skills at different levels, even with uh, the little ones. So I think that it's just trying to not forget that, you know, language should serve a purpose. It kind of goes back to the purposefulness of, of, of a class, right? So the it's not just to create an assignment or finish assignment for the teacher, but it should have some sort of purpose, some hopefully real world purpose that they can relate to and try to have them begin thinking more critically uh, over time. How much is critical thinking part of your conversation, Speedy, and when you're looking at uh, teacher trainers, does that come up per se or is it more implied through some of the 
the activities and teachings that they are uh, a part of? I think uh, I think that's the key. That's the base. We have to promote in the students to 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 have this critical thinking in, at every moment since the very moment of planning. Instead of just uh, thinking about what to teach and that's it, but uh, but to go through all of this and, and it goes hand to hand to the beginning of this talk. How to immerse students in the task and how to get them. Uh, how to get them engaged in a meaningful way that they actually develop the language. Uh, that starts with critical thinking. You have to know your students, you have to uh, have a dialogue with them and, and, and expect, in fact, I was remembering about ESP in, in, in the area of English for specific purposes, there's something that it's called the retrospective syllabus. And the retrospective syllabus is based on not having a syllabus and just knowing the field of work in which you are going to teach the language and to carry the actual analysis during the course in which you show up to class and you spend some moments with the students with this critical thinking discussion and dialogue and then from there you you do the analysis for the further classes and then after the first encounter in which all, in which is only critical discussion with the students about whatever you you need to know for the for the immediate first classes, to take the time every single class, some minutes, to have this dialogue, this questioning, this analyzing, and start creating your own syllabus. So in a day-by-day -day basis, you form you with this dialogue, you form your lesson plan for the following class. And then after but but it's not just one lesson plan. I mean, you have to look at the whole picture from the dialogue. So you start to compose segments of uh, a bun or, or, or uh, bunches of, let's say, four or five classes, and those segments start to shape the syllabus, and then you start to write that syllabus as retrospective. And, and I think, uh, as uh, it says in this book from, e from ESP, from uh, Hutchinson and Waters, that ESP, uh, general English, it's claimed that a general English does not exist, it's always ESP. I think this is one of the cases in it, this totally applies to a real, uh, uh, to, to general English classes, sorry. Because if you take the time to talk to your students to have this uh, analysis, you start to develop this critical thinking and this questioning. And, and this is something uh, that we try to do in the assistantship program, that we try to do in the teaching workshop. And, uh, and sometimes it's, uh, over and over asking and asking students and asking the students and I already had one student telling me teacher uh, I, every time I come here you have so many questions and and sometimes I don't know what to answer well I, I don't expect you to have all the answers and because I don't I don't have them I mean I, I I'm, I'm good at asking no? <laughs> in that sense and um, and that helps that that critical thinking I think it's a key word I would like to show you very quickly, Ben, uh, now that we're talking about this, I'm gonna share it with you my screen because I found one of my presentations. Can you see that? Yes. Uh, this is part of the presentation I do on questioning techniques for the classroom. Uh, and it's something that we we don't actually go that deep into, but it's, uh, it's something that I found in, in a webpage about Bloom's Taxonomy Hierarchy of Learning. Uh, and the types of questions you may have. And, uh, well, I, I think this may give us a little bit of uh, help on a couple of questions to be used or the kind of questions to be used for, for promoting this uh, critical thinking in students. If you can see in here, we have the, um, uh, the different levels. Remember, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. These are questions directly for the classroom. And... Uh, and this house goes uh, as you go higher. Uh, they they try to um, develop in the students the idea of um, not not just staying with the surface of the situation, but going a little bit beyond, inferencing and and trying to uh, whether what they're doing in class it's okay or or or, or needs improvement even though you can still ask for what can you do here, what can be improved, what other ideas, what other angles, what do you think happens if something that I do very frequently, do you think this would work in a real class? 
And sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no. But I, but I think this may uh, help us a little bit. Uh, it's, it's just a general view, right? This has a whole background and in and, and the article, which I didn't find right now, I just have my presentation, but in the article, uh, it's a little bit more explicit. Yeah, and uh, Pity, if uh, you could leave that up there for a second, I would like to contrast this idea of the question types that you have here from Bloom's taxonomy to that of Wiggins and McTie's understanding by designs, where they talk about essential questions. And I think it's important to note that the the art of asking questions in class, I think uh, I look at it from two perspectives, one top down, the other uh, bottom up. So if you start with essential questions, those being in terms of Bloom's taxonomy, those that towards the top of the pyramid, uh, these are more of your deeper thinking, uh, longer living types of questions that students are going to keep thinking about and keep discussing and, and trying to, to answer over time. So it's probably not, you know, a question, a yes, no question or a question that's going to be just kind of a, a passing question. It's going to be one that students are revisiting over time, maybe even over days or maybe even over uh, weeks. But also, you know, uh, we can see uh, and we can certainly, I think, have had experiences where students, we ask a question and they're not able to answer. So we immediately, we would go down this pyramid and ask more simple questions until they're able to kind of respond. Again, depending on the type of question, depending on the level of the student, maturity and so right. on of, of the students. But th but the idea is to find ways as teachers to use questions to promote maybe speaking or writing or, or conversations and and really trying to, and again, I think of this as a, being a, an art form because really it, it takes practice to find the best way to present questions and use questions to promote um, you know, dialogue. So I think this is a good diagram that you have here, um, but there are other ways to look at it as well. And through uh, Wiggins and McTie's where they talk about six facets of understandings, we can think about forming questions through these different facets. So for example, to explain, we could have questions related to explanations. We could have questions related to interpretation. Right. Okay. We could have, and uh, apply, having perspective, empathy, self-knowledge. All of these six facets of understandings mm -hmm. can be thought of as being achieved through the act of asking questions. So I think there's different ways to look at questions. And I, I think Bloom's taxonomy certainly is a very good way to, to think about it, but it's also not the only way. And there's other ways beyond uh, Wiggins and McTighe, but the, the whole point here is to try to find, uh, you know, ways to implement kind of a Socratic method approach where at the end of the day, all, we are doing as as teachers are asking the questions and students are pursuing those answers right, right. And, I, I, and, think, yeah. I, I think we can leave these links in in the in the fan page in in teacher learning cast so if anybody's interested on in looking at this i'll just take a little bit more of time in looking for the actual article when i took this from um uh and um i suppose at the end of the presentation the the, the source and uh and we can put it there so we can have access to uh, to both per perspectives in here because I kind of listened to the ones you just mentioned kind of interested uh, interesting uh, and, and 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 it would be very very good to have the the, the both of them as a comparative because I, I love when we can pick from here and from there and make our own recipe absolutely and then maybe we can uh, uh, and another subsequent broadcast dig a little bit deeper into uh, questions right. and the right. active questioning. Great. All right, so um, a couple more points here that I want to make and uh, from this article. And that is, uh, you know, they, they basically, they, they show some uh, different, well, the last thing that they talk about is how and how open or closed a particular uh, task, immersive task is. And I think this is really important now, especially with technology, is how open or closed or how connected to the audience that they are uh, you know, engaged in 
how, how open should it be? And this is going to be also depend on the type of activity, the maturity level of the students, the level of the students and so on. But it, it's very important really to try to use those opportunities, um, you know, to, to open up as much as possible the educative experience. You know, we've talked a lot about e-portfolios and I, I think of e-portfolios as one way of opening up the the immersive task because then students are beginning to think about how to you know make their e-portfolio their online presence purposeful for them right and for others and so i think anything that we do with english language learners it's a matter of trying to find out how open or closed should it be in order to achieve those those results in order to achieve those objectives or goals that we have set out for that particular task so I think this is a very important point, how open and closed and an immersive task should be. And, and this is something I think to consider whenever you're planning and implementing uh, such a, a task. Um, the last thing I want to mention here, and I'll just go through these very briefly, but in practice, they talk about um, what, it, what it really looks like, right? So uh, they mention the following, problem solving, decision making, creative tasks, personalizing the tasks or personalize the learning experience, having debates or being able to form arguments. All of these are, again, these are authentic things, things ways of thinking that, that you know, most of us deal with on a daily basis. So it's really not, it's trying not to divorce what, how people, how learners think normally and how they should think in class, right? That it's basically the same. We, we need to try to promote these these different ways of thinking, solving problems, decision making, maybe resolving conflict. This wasn't in the, the article, but I think that's another uh, issue is how we learn how to resolve cognitive conflict, right? That, that how do we resolve problems, but maybe a conflict between two different individuals that force us to learn to have perspective, right? To see the other side of of a, of a situation, whether or not we agree with it or not, but being able to be conscious of the other side, um, trying to bring that into the language learning experience, I think is is really important. And so I think looking at uh, you know the classroom in those terms, I think are very very important. Things that I would add that the article doesn't discuss, and I, I know that you were. Uh, planning Pity to talk a little bit about this uh, either today or maybe another day of, of how to bring in concrete activities and learning and abstract learning and also the reflective process, how those all kind of intertwine into a, a, a learning experience. Um, so I think that, you know, looking at the ways that we think of and how to how we communicate and trying to find the, the best way to uh, engage all of those into an immersive task situation, I think is uh, I think important to consider. Yes, I, I like I like a lot of the topic today since you since since we were uh, planning the script and you sent this information. I I, I I knew we would spend some time in this in this part because it it covers a lot of a lot of things and 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 I would add in. in all of these last aspects you mentioned, the how broad or how narrow is, is, is the activity, how open the activity is going to be, uh, having this um, uh, cognitive aspect cover. In fact, I kind of remember uh, about, I think the book is Teaching Young Learners. It talks about demands and support and talks about linguistic demands versus cognitive demands in the task and activities we bring into the classroom. Uh, but uh, I think all of this comes into the idea of uh, what you mentioned at the beginning somehow is having students to be tuned in the same mood. Uh, well, not exactly the same. We don't want them to think the same, but we want them in the same tune. Let's call it like that. Uh, so that they are, are actually working together uh, and having this uh, intra uh, interdependence for in, during the task in order to grow together. I like that idea. And, and, and I kind of like even even uh, even that that concept. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned it like that, like tuning the students, or it's something that just came to my mind at the moment, but 
But I like that that idea. This immersive task, I think the, one of the main goals at parallel to the linguistic goal of the task has to be uh, the tuning of the students in a sense, because I like when this kind of activities helps us to develop more than the language, help students to, to develop this intrapersonal skills, communication that it's going to be very useful uh, for the use of, if you want to see it very academically, for the use of, of the language itself, just the ability of having this, uh, this uh, relationships amongst each other and, and, and being able to tune to another person as to perform together a task and, and, and have enrichment. I think that's what's going to happen in real life when they actually go and use the language outside. I'm going to communicate with somebody else because I want to connect with somebody else at a certain level and have this growth working together. Yeah, I think uh, looking at it in terms of cooperative learning versus collaborative learning, right? So if it's, a, if it's a collaborative learning experience, maybe there's a central goal that everybody's trying to achieve versus also cooperative learning where maybe there are individual or smaller group goals within a larger group goal and looking at it, you know, not one or the other. So we can try to achieve both cooperative and collaborative learning, both within the same context and looking at how students, language learners can not only be interested in trying to achieve their own goals, but interested in trying to help others achieve their goals. So having, like you said, this interdependency, I think, yeah, it's just another layer of our planning of how, what, you know, what to think about when we're thinking of our, our activities, right? And how we can try to orient our students. A whole new those. topic, Ben. I'm just thinking about many things about this. I just yeah. came to my mind this kind of uh, Ben Euler's diagrams in which uh, we, I, I kind of, I taught a class long ago about uh, uh, management, educational management. And, and we would discuss precisely about this, not as goals, but as needs. The individual needs, the task needs themselves, and the group needs themselves to be covered and, and to be tuned again for learning. And, and I think we can go on and on. And, and I have a lot of material for further shows. <laughs> yeah, same here. Uh, just uh, throwing up a couple of uh, links here that uh, those of you who are watching can uh, check. Uh, and uh, I think it's it's worth looking at these articles. And this is a table of contents here to uh, how we think from, from Dewey, which gives additional perspective. Um, so, but I think, yeah, we're almost out of time for today, but <clears throat> I think this is a very good uh, topic to, to look at how to bring in immersive tasks. And uh, I would encourage everyone to, uh, you know, feel free to let us know how you're implementing immersive tasks into your own classroom and challenges that you've faced, successes that you've had, we'd be, be happy to uh, you know, hear those. And, and again, if anyone wants to be part of the conversation, feel free to reach out to us in Facebook. You can reach us at facebook.com forward slash TLC ELT. Of course, you can uh, send us uh, comments directly to our websites. Uh, BD can be reached at homers2000.wixsite.com forward slash P-I-R-Y-H-A. P -I -R -Y -H -A. I can be reached at benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com. And I would like to uh, encourage everyone who is living here close in the Aguas Calientes area that there is a conference coming up on May 25th mm -hmm. at the Universidad Panamericana campus Aguas Calientes. So uh, feel free if you have not, uh, I think actually it's closed. If you have tickets, then great. Let us know if you're going to be there. Uh, this is the Facebook page, um, but I'll be giving a talk there on May 25th on practice. Practice makes perfect. And uh, be happy to, to see you and uh, at, the, at this conference. They've had this conference many times in the past. It's always been very enjoyable, very educational. So uh, I encourage you to, to uh, attend this if, if at all possible. Right, and hopefully, uh, well, you check check out if you can do the live transmission in that conference. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we will. Your I, I will. We we yeah. also have uh, the the teaching aids exhibition here at the Universidad Autónoma de Aguascalientes with the four semester students of the BA in English Language Teaching and the teacher Adriana Macias Torres. She organizes this event. She's been organizing this event for seven years. It's going to be May twenty second. 
It begins at 9 a.m. and it's going to be the whole day running on. We're going to have a lot of people invited from different schools and it's an open event for anybody to come and, and see what uh, students do. We just talked about this in the radio. It's it's an in integral activity because it's some they they work in a day by day basis in the material in the um, in in all the rationales for the material and they prepare all this for the class as development of learning how to design material. But as a parallel activity uh, and it requires extra effort from students and the teacher himself out of teaching hours out of the hours in the classroom. For this for this course, they plan this event, this exhibition. They they select the students, select the topic. Students design all what is going to be done. They have kind of mini workshops during the day. They have the exhibition of the material at different tables, and they have many many activities during the day that are very uh, um, enjoyable. Uh, I, I had the pleasure to be in there every year. So I, we invite you all, everybody. It's an open event here at the Autonoma, May twenty second. Uh, starting at 9 a.m., Teaching AIDS exhibition. And uh, hopefully we can get Adriana Macias, who's uh, in charge of this, uh, on one of our broadcasts so we can also uh, learn from her and talk to her about the, the experience afterwards. And, and hopefully we can uh, do some sort of live uh, broadcast during the event. That would be nice. So if you're interested also, um, feel free to join us in Facebook uh, during those times if you're not able to attend face-to-face. Uh, uh, hopefully we can get some interviews in that uh, with some of the students and, and show some of their uh, their work that they do. It is a great event. We we go every year and it's uh, we're excited this year to be able to kind of uh, promote a little bit more of this uh, event uh, through uh, teacher learning cast. Right, Ben, I think uh, time just stretches again. We have a lot to talk and we can do it in further programs. And uh, I'm glad always to have this talk to you. I take a lot of information for myself and my classes. And for sure, I will implement this uh, idea of the questioning with these new authors you just mentioned. Well, not new authors, but uh, uh, this uh, parallel comparison with what I normally use. And thank you very much, Ben. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Facebook viewers. Yes, thank you, everyone. And uh, again, we'll see you next uh, next Saturday. Thanks, everyone, and uh, take care. Keep on learning. Bye.